Okay, so our episode today, um, usually we start with a little story or anecdote and we delve into our topic, but today we decided to switch it up. We're gonna start with a quote, because we love quotes. And this is a quote from someone who I think is actually like one of the few original thinkers in this industry. Her name's Elaine Wu. One of the few original thinkers. Yeah, girl. Shots fired at the industry. Gosh. <laughs> it was mostly directed at you. <laughs> anyway, so. Elaine's quote, we've both fixated on it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it grinds my gears a little bit. Let's talk about it. Do you want to read it? So yeah, Elaine says, financial institutions make people feel safe by hiding risk behind layers of complexity. Bitcoin brings this risk front and center and brags about it on the internet. So, so why does that grind your gears? There is a deep irony there. And to be fair to Elaine, I think that this might have been true at the time that she wrote it. I'm not exactly sure what year she wrote it in. But if we go back to 2011, 2012, 2013, some of the earlier days of Bitcoin, I think that there might have been truth in this, that in fact Bitcoin was bringing all of the risk inherent in the financial system front and center and bragging about it on the internet. But if we look at the industry around Bitcoin today, I would argue that there is just as much financial complexity, if not more, than exists in the banking system uh, that we know and hate we just of the lie about it more, right? We lie to ourselves. So this Indeed. is what we're going to talk about today is banking Bitcoin. Are we just building the same shit in a different way? So, okay, before we dive into this, though, let's just address the question, what the hell even is a bank? Yeah. I know it's something that I need a banking license do for. I know need to what go through is? all of this like regulatory process. If someone asked process. you to explain a bank, do you think you could explain it? What is a bank? How do you feel about that? Who I feel like this is the wrong room for that because probably most people in this room have like filed for MTLs at some point and have a good sense of what, of banks what a bank are. is. Okay. But let's cover it anyway. Okay, so I want to go back in history. Um, the word bank, I'm going to get nerdy. I love it. Um, so the word, Drop some etymology on us. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me go back to the etymology, which is ironic because you're the history major. This is supposed to yeah. be your job, Jill. Yeah. Um, so the word bank or banca um, is an Italian word that literally means bench. Uh, the way that banking started, I mean, banking has existed forever in some way, shape, or form. But banking really became formalized and institutionalized um, in Venice in the 1500s by merchants um, who are going on these journeys, if you remember the story of you know, people sailing to the brave new world, people traveling the Silk Road, what happened is people needed financing to finance their journeys. And we actually covered this in our episode on mutual funds and ETFs where we talked about the birth of pooled investment vehicles. But the idea was is that when they were financing these journeys, instead of going out and trying to find a nobleman or a wealthy merchant to finance this, this transaction, they could go to a bank. And the bank would also help them um, if they were selling something and were getting a lot of cash from it and needed a place to store it. You can't exactly put a pile of gold bars or a pile of cash under your pillow at night. They would deposit it at the bank for safekeeping. And then banks started saying, hmm, we have deposits, people giving us assets. We're giving out loans. What if we started taking some of this cash we have and investing with it, earning more yield? And so the practice of modern day banking was born. And, and today, banks do a lot of different things, but I don't think people really appreciate how big banking is. And what a brilliant business model oh, that is. You make they stumbled so upon. much fucking money. You give me money, <laughs> I give it to other people, and I somehow make money off of that. Right. Right. Like that is a brilliant arbitrage that we take for granted today. That was stumbled upon. I mean, it goes back farther, of course, it goes than Venice, way farther. but. Yeah. That was really the origin, as you say, of modern So banking, banking by the way, um, it started with deposits and loans. And if you think about deposits, deposits are an asset on a bank balance sheet. If you go to the bank and you give the bank $100, that's $100 of assets that they have. But they also have a liability because at some point you're going to come back and get your $100. The way banks work at their core is they take in deposits from people like you and me or large institutions, and then they lend out money. Now, when they lend out money, they charge people to borrow money. And say they charge you 5% to borrow $100. Your $100 is being loaned out, the bank gets $5 on that 100 every year, and they're gonna pay you $1, and they're gonna pocket the four. That's the model at its core. Um, and so what I think is really interesting is banking actually comprises 
of the global economy. So fully 12% of all economic activity across the world is just people passing money around. So, okay, let's, let's start to unpack this a little bit, though, because we're witnessing right now a phenomenon in which everybody wants to be a bank. And I'm not just talking about in Bitcoin, everyone wants to be their own bank. I'm talking about in the wider world outside of crypto. Everyone so see, wants to be a bank. We see startups moving into this area. We see big sort of no longer startups moving into this area, the likes of Apple issuing their credit card partnering with Goldman Sachs and Marcus. We see Facebook, of course, exploring all kinds of other payment options that they can get into, not just Libra, but even outside of that. Yeah. Um, Uber is a bank in a lot of ways. They finance, a whole financial industry has sprung up around Uber and drivers and vehicles. Um, with something people don't appreciate, Square is actually a bank as well. They do a lot of lending to SMEs and they make a lot of money that way. Um, and then there's also challenger banks yeah. as well. Not even just these companies <laughs> that we sort of know and love more conventionally as technology companies, but banks like Chime and Simple in uh, Europe, we have N26, Monzo. Mm -hmm. There's this whole rise of challengers to what in a lot of ways to me still feel like not just the dinosaurs, but in a way the merchants who you were talking about in Venice, like all of these old white men, these big institutions, <laughs> we're seeing a rise of challengers to them and a big part of what they're fighting for is deposits. Yeah. That's what this whole business model keeps coming back to is deposits. So, so let's talk about deposits in the context of Bitcoin. So some of you may have been around town this week. Um, I gave a talk at Blockstack Summit last week where I talked about the red pill versus the blue pill. Um, and a lot of what I talked about with relation to Bitcoin is even though there was this premise that with Bitcoin we could be our own bank and we could own our own assets in self-custody and be self-sovereign, really what we've done is built banks but shoved Bitcoin in them. Um, the most valuable- so wait, what is the red pill and the blue pill? So Here, the red pill is that. we believe that we're gonna escape the, this world of banking we live in um, through Bitcoin that we're gonna create a new financial system and it's gonna have all these beautiful attributes. But the reality is, is what we've done as a result of regulation and as a result of business models, because you need to make money, what we've done is build banks. And all of the most profitable companies in our industry are banks. They're in the business of taking your coins and my coins and everyone's coins, locking them up and making money off owning coins. So is the red pill, I recognize that this is happening. Ooh. What, like? The red pill is, I think this is not happening. Ah, oh, I see. So actually we've taken the blue pill. That was my premise. <laughs> but then I was like, maybe we should take both and it'll be a I want the purple pill. pill where I kind of know that it's not happening in actuality, but I'm pretending that it is. But, but let's talk about this, right? So the biggest narrative unfolding right now, or one of the biggest, is um, the institutionalization of crypto. I don't really know what that means anymore because I feel like it's gotten so abstracted at this point that it doesn't even make sense anymore. <laughs> but really what institutional crypto is about, where the attention is, is custody. People want other people to hold their coins because guess what? We don't want to be responsible. And I've heard you make this point over and over again. The fact that the most valuable companies in crypto are intermediaries, right? And so I don't know about you, but I got into this space because I was excited that we could build this whole alternative to the existing financial system, starting again from scratch. And as Elaine puts it, bringing the risk inherent in the financial system, putting it front and center, making it transparent, making it And allowing people to make choices, and by the way. And giving people options, giving people indeed. Yeah. And instead, okay, I have the choice of using Coinbase or BitMEX or whatever it is, whatever the casino du jour is. <laughs> but in reality, what we've created resembles the old system only with fewer risk metrics and models, with fewer controls around it, and with no regulation more around opacity. liquidity requirements. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, and what I think is interesting, so I want to go back to financial industry concepts. So you and I have talked a lot about the financial crisis because it was a defining point for both of, in both of our lives. Um, I was just graduating college. You were still in college, I think. Were you in college yeah. at that point? Yeah. yeah. 
And so, where were you on October thirty first, two thousand eight? I saw you tweet this yesterday. I was I was in Fondren Library at Rice University, watching Bear and Lehman meltdown. I was getting job offers rescinded from the investment banks that I had gotten job offers from, and I was thinking, what the fuck am I going to do in six months? That's what I was doing. I was like, <laughs> well, that's been fun. <laughs> It was great. How about you? Where were you? I, I was at a Halloween party in my freshman dorm room when the uh, when the Bitcoin white paper got published. I'm not. Yeah, you lie. still had a few. Yeah, years I of still had four years. Little did I know that then I would graduate and be graduating still into a meltdown yeah. of Occupy Wall Street, et cetera. It became very relevant very quickly. But in but. 2008, um, <clears throat> basically what we recognized is over time, um, banks need scale to work. And so what started happening is consolidation. Um, 20 years ago, there were a lot more banks in the US than there are today. Today, the big four banks own about 70% of deposits. So it's really concentrated. And remember, it's a war for deposits. It's a war for That's deposits. You need capital on your balance sheet. And so um, what they did after the 2008 financial crisis is they created this new designation for banks called a SIFI. And SIFI stands for Systemically Important Financial Institution. And really what the goal was is every quarter, every bank would report a number of different metrics, including how many deposits they had, how much debt they had, the nature of that debt, the risk of that debt, and a bunch of other stuff. And then they would assign, um, the, the government would assign a risk score to each bank. It's just and, worth double clicking on why that happened, though, yeah. right? Which was that banks were failing. Now, the importance of that to society as a whole cannot be understated, which is why this whole notion of something, of a bank, of an institution being too big to fail came about, and which is why the bailouts happened. And we can argue, and we probably will at some point. We're gonna talk about bailouts. Whether the bailouts were worthwhile or not, but out of this grew this notion of, okay, if a bank is too big to fail, then we need to be monitoring it closely, and we need to have this idea of, a systemically important financial institution. Exactly, and so they started tracking these financial institutions. Today, the largest bank in the United States is J.P. Morgan Chase, and so they're the systemically most important bank in our economy. Um, I bank with J.P. Morgan Chase, so I feel that, and a lot of people in this room probably bank with Chase as well. Um, but basically, the, the idea was there's this massive existential risk when you have just four institutions that hold three quarters of all retail, commercial, and institutional deposits in the economy. That's a lot of risk concentrated in a very small number of places. Now, let's look at the crypto industry. Let's look at ourselves. Let's hold up the beautiful introspective mirror and see how we're doing. In 2017, in the Ethereum community, a bunch of people put, a money, in, uh, put money into a smart contract called the DAO. It was a new innovation, never been seen before, but basically the intent was for it to be an investment firm. And fully 15% of the circulating supply of Ether at that time was put into the smart contract. A lot of risk, a lot of coins in one place, and guess what happened? What happened, Jill? It got hacked. It did not get hacked. I know, I know, The I smart know. contract was Semantics. used in an unintended Semantics. way that allowed someone to drain all of the funds from the DAO. So all of a sudden, you have the Ethereum community at this existential crossroads. 15% of everyone's money. Is this where you shill your ETC? Also? No, I'm not. <laughs> Fuck you, Jill. I apologize. It's Ooh. not professional. <laughs> But the ETC... ETC is a sensitive subject for It's a for very all of sensitive okay. subject. That's another <laughs> podcast episode. Um, but look, here's what happened. There are a bunch of people who just lost a bunch of money, right? And they're looking around, and they're seeing this massive, massive existential threat. So they all got together, and they had a vote over the weekend. I remember a this bailout. Vote. And they did a bailout. This is what happens when institutions get too big to fail. Wait, can you guys stop trading? <laughs> Please stop trading. Does anyone know that joke? No? It's look okay. it up. Just look up Vitalik, please stop trading. It's pretty funny. We, we shouldn't laugh about anyway, it. Anyway, point being, you know, a lot of the excitement in the crypto space, not just right now, but going back years, has been around how can we create new financial assets? How can we create new financial models? How can we create new financial structures? And it's just important that we don't start to kid ourselves into believing that these financial structures that we're creating are any less risky 
or even any more transparent than what existed prior. And this goes not just for exchanges that are the custodians of whatever percentage, majority, yeah, vast fully, majority. Uh, fully 20% of, of coins are in custody today, according to my count. If 20% of coins have been lost, it's closer to 30%, and it's probably much higher than that. And, you know, we can look from there, we can move and look at things like the DAO, things like DeFi. And there, okay, I understand that we can make the case of, oh, well, this is more transparent, things are happening on chain, et cetera. Firstly, not everything is happening on chain. Secondly, don't tell me that just because something is happening on chain makes it transparent to the average retail trader, consumer, et cetera, because it's not. The average person does not have the ability to go in and conduct the chain analysis that's necessary to understand what's going on in the system, just like the average person does not have the ability to go into JP Morgan's balance sheet and understand the credit and the counterparty. But wait, hold on. JP Morgan can not even go into its own balance sheet and understand their credit risk. That's, that's a separate like issue. That's a new low. <laughs> that is a new low. Indeed. Indeed. Let's just be clear on that. <laughs> and I think the same thing is happening here. Um, I think we would love to believe that we're shorting the banks and going long Bitcoin, but we're going long banking with Bitcoin. That's right. And Bloomberg just had an article yesterday that I want to hear your thoughts on, Melton, mm -hmm. because they came out with this whole article about how the Bitcoin lending market has taken off dramatically in the last two years while the crypto world has been in a bear market and it's introduced all of this systemic risk and it's going to blow up and blah, blah, blah. And on the one hand, I think that they make very valid points that like, look, we don't have good controls in place. We don't have good methods of transparency. And here I'm not even talking about like loans on DeFi. I'm talking about just loans that the likes of BlockFi are making mm -hmm. um, or Genesis or whoever it is. But at the same time, I also want to recognize like, okay, this makes for a decent Bloomberg article, but when you put it in the grand scheme of things, the sizes that we're talking about are still minuscule. But I think what's interesting here is, let's say, for example, the Bitcoin market today is $200 billion. Let's say that today the Bitcoin lending market is $10 billion. What that means is 5% of the circulating supply of Bitcoin is at default risk. And I think what we don't think about is, and this is the question I like to ask people, let's say what happened to Ethereum with the DAO happens to Bitcoin. If, uh, so Coinbase and Zappo post-merger probably have about 6% of all Bitcoin in circulation in their custody. What happens if Coinbase gets hacked and fully 6% of the Bitcoin supply is stolen? Do we roll back the Bitcoin blockchain? Nah. What about 10%? <laughs> what about 15%? What about at 20%? Just don't ask Jeremy Rubin. <laughs> but because this, this conversation, right, somewhat legitimately came up when Binance got hacked. Yeah, it did. And the whole point of that, um, when Binance got hacked in May of this year, their hot wallet, um, their Bitcoin hot wallet got hacked, um, all of the Bitcoin in it was stolen. It wasn't a huge sum of money, but it was about 0.3% of the circulating supply of Bitcoin. And one of the conversations that was broached is like, hey, should we organize uh, a block reorg, effectively bailing out these coin holders and reverse the mm -hmm. transactions? And um, that was talked about, and it was immediately rejected. And the comment that came out of it, and the reason Jeremy Rubin, who's a Bitcoin developer, the reason he brought it up is he wanted to see if people were open to having that conversation. He's, he was it was a great experiment. Yeah, he actually. was going to leave Bitcoin. He was like, if this is a conversation we're willing to entertain as a community, then I don't need to be part of this community. Yeah, yeah, it's a great way to stress test it. So what do we do from here, Jill? What do we do? So we wanted to short the bankers. Instead, we've all become bankers. <laughs> Many of you in this room are probably Bitcoin bankers. You may not wear a suit, but I see a lot of uh, sneakers and nice. I haven't seen a lot of Patagucci here. Yeah, no, Patagonia is out, Arcteryx is in. Arcteryx. If Arcteryx wants to sponsor our podcast, by the way, totally Yeah, down. shill it, Jill, <laughs> shill it. CBD cocktails, Arcteryx vests. <laughs> <laughs> what else? You know my style. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, to me, it's not all doom and gloom. I think that there is a lot of exciting stuff that's coming out, products that are being rolled out, new protocols that are being rolled out, stuff in the DeFi world, et cetera, 
that are putting the emphasis on enabling individuals to act as their own custodians. To me, a lot of this conversation, though, is a more existential question of just, do people actually want to be their own banks? And in what contexts do they? Because as we asked out, most of the people in crypto are totally comfortable putting their assets in what are basically banks. Yeah, um, let's ask this question. Who here actually wants to be their own bank? And we're not keeping score. Who here is absolutely uninterested in being their own bank and is perfectly happy to let someone else bank them? I see some hands. It's fine. I'm taking well, down your names. No, we're not no. going to be let this in is, next year. This is a I safe kid, space. I kid. This is a safe space. <laughs> we're all friends here. <laughs> Um, but I think that's a really important question. I think the better question is, for the people who don't want to be their own bank, how do we convince you that you, you should be your own bank? That's right. And what I will it that, take? I think that, you know, even bigger than that, the question is just like, what is it that we're actually solving for here, right? And this is the constant kind of idea maze that we are in within crypto. It, We've talked about the blind man and the elephant before. Yes. You know, this is a classic case of everyone sort of looks at this and sees their own dream of this trustless, decentralized, transparent future of what the financial industry could be or could have been. But Jill, I want to yet... get rich, so let me build my bank <laughs> exactly. so I can be the next Rockefeller. Exactly. <laughs> we all just want to be the new masters of the universe. That's right. I'm actually working on a blog post called The New Aristocrats that's about this exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, so though, one of, the, <laughs> one of the beautiful things about being in this space is that it allows us to nerd out on things like banking deposits and rehypothecation and systemic risk. All of these things that frankly, even when I worked on Wall Street, nobody talked about like this. nobody talked about this stuff. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. In fact, it was the unsexy thing to talk about. If you were talking about it, you weren't enough of a BSD, you weren't enough of a master of the universe. Yeah. To, you were a loser. Yeah. Loser. You were in middle office. <laughs> and one of office. I've mentioned this before, one of the joys of being a junior kid on the trading desk was I was the person who had to stay late after work and deal with all of the middle office bullshit. <laughs> But through doing that, I came to have this understanding of how messed up the existing financial system is. And so I think, you know, maybe a note to end on here is thinking about, okay, it's been 11 years since the white paper was launched. You and I have talked a lot about the context in which Satoshi launched Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's no coincidence that it was the first time in decades that people were really scrutinizing the financial system and I think that it's just important, I think maybe the takeaway of this little gear grinding that we've been doing is that we need to be not only scrutinizing the old school financial system, but also bring building. that scrutiny to the new, new one, one that we're building. building. And what I'll just end with is I think it's very difficult to change what we do when everything we do is defined by everything that's come before, but we have to try harder. I am unwilling to settle. I am unwilling to compromise. And I think we have to continually ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Because if it's just to create a new asset that we're going to treat just like every other asset, then we should give up now. And that's it. Thanks. But for don't give up. With us. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with us.